All right. Uh, so I have the the man, the one and only Anderson Williams, with me on this call. Andy, thank you so much for making time uh, for this call. Uh, this is this is long overdue, and uh, yeah. uh, I I've been uh, there. There there are few there are few people on the earth um, that are hard to describe, and you're one of those people. Uh, the, the closest adjective I can I can uh, I can use to describe you would be the word enigma. So uh, for for me you're an enigma. So uh, and I and I think I think uh, um, I don't I don't use that word or throw that word around for for uh, a lot of people. I don't use that word lightly. But uh, um, I, I was blown away um, back in 2017 when I heard you for the first time. And um, uh, you flew halfway across the world, honored our invitation, and you just you just came in and you delivered probably one of the most incredible messages uh, that I've heard in my uh, in my 16 years as a believer. And uh, uh, I'm not, not I'm never going to forget that. And uh, um, I, I've heard my share of sermons uh, before and since, but nothing has quite stuck with me. Uh, like like that message that you delivered back in 2017. So um, um, it's, it's it's long overdue, and I'm I'm grateful for Zoom. I'm grateful that we're able to uh, have this conversation now. Uh, I just for those uh, friends of mine who will uh, hear this recording later, I, I just want uh, to to have them uh, see a glimpse of your heart and your journey, and uh, mm -hmm. and and just to hear a bit about your testimony and. Uh, um, yeah, um, if you could just share a bit about what your journey and your testimony, and uh, yeah. and then I could I can jump into my my questions. Certainly, um, well, Tara, it's an honor to be a part of this conversation. Um, as you said, it's long overdue. I met you um, several years ago; feels almost like a lifetime ago. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed the time that we had in Dubai, the conversations we had outside of the conference. And um, several of the plans and initiatives that we put in place, some of which we could not materialize. And I think um, now is as good a time as any for us to begin to think about how we can actualize and put into effect some of those conversations we had way back then. Um, for those of you who don't know me in this conversation, um, I have a somewhat very interesting path to my current location. It's been filled with um, amazing experiences. It's been filled with amazing disappointments. It's been filled with some of the most incredible experiences and some of the most um, profound betrayal from good friends and others. The best way I could describe it is that um, where I am right now, it's a unique mixture of um, extreme purpose blended with enormous pain. It's a dynamic combination of overwhelming satisfaction, but with um, certain levels of, of discomfort that is almost hard to secure or correct or heal. But um, from my life as a kid, a child, um, growing up for a large part on the streets and uh, coming into an experience with Christ when I was, uh, when I was just about 18 or 19 years, um, having had some of the most um, remarkable friends and colleagues and mentors who um, guided and pointed my mind in the right direction, who were able to massage my spirit and put a certain level of, of clarity within my own mind to errors and mistakes that I would have made. But in the middle of it all, um, it's amazing. The Bible does in fact say that God, um, that, that, that God could basically take a life and um, despite all of its stumblings and failings, that God has this incredible ability to point a human life to a place of divine purpose. All things work together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And all things, if you look at the individual things, it may not always be pleasant, may not always be profound, may not always be fantastic. But when it's looked at in a collective basis, even the disappointments, even the discomforts, even the pains, all together, it creates this profound, overwhelming life that God could use at the end. And that, I think, sums up how my life is. 
if I have to go into the details, this conversation would take weeks and months and years. Um, but what I can say is that um, my path started like everyone else's, started as a sinner. I don't think that any one of us were born with blue blood and um, with a gold spoon in, in, in their mouth. We all started from a position of lost, trying to discover God. And that's where mine started. And um, I found myself in a Catholic church trying to discover God. And then I eventually um, stumbled into a Pentecostal environment. And from a very early age, I really did not think that Christianity was supposed to be this boring experience that was um, filled with a lack of clarity and vacant mind and lack of thoughtfulness. And so I began to plunge into the word of God from the moment I got saved to try to discover truth and to see to what extent that truth could mold and guide my life going forward. It's been an amazing journey. I've been privileged to travel all over the world, but about um, six years ago, life took a very interesting turn. And um, that turn, though starting off and looked very, very bad, almost like an abortion, it turned out to be one of the most remarkable moments in my entire life. Um, and over the last six years, I would say I've been to well over 90 something countries in the last six years. And I've been able to see the purpose of God um, on a ground swell, almost like a dynamic ground swell that goes way beyond what I ever in my wildest dreams ever considered or thought possible. Today, I think we are standing at a threshold of enormous advancement, enormous breakthroughs, um, remarkable insight from God, tremendous capacity to build and design and create infrastructure that will allow the purpose of God to literally move at a rapid pace across the nations of the earth. This is a time unlike any other. And I say that with the greatest degree of, of regard and respect and fear and awe, because um, honestly, I've never seen it like this before. And I'm not flattering anyone in saying that, that um, if ever there was a time for us to connect to God even more profoundly, this is the time. Because um, I think that God himself is, is, is on a quest to move his purpose forward in, 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 in unprecedented speed towards the culmination of divine intent. So I know that I didn't give you all the nice um, um, glossy details. That is something I tend to hold close to my chest and a few people I give the details to. But nonetheless, I prefer to speak less about me and more about, about God. So that's it in a very succinct manner, Tyra. Right. <laughs> okay. Um... Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for, for sharing that, Andy. Um, yeah, so um, I'm just going to dive into, uh, into my questions. I'm going to uh, uh, beg your pardon in advance because I'm going to pick your masterful mind uh, over the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. And uh, I know by the end of this time, it's going to feel like we're just scratching the surface, but uh, I just want, I want friends, I want... Uh, I want uh, people who are going to watch this, guys, young leaders who are going to watch this to um, get a glimpse of the kind of conversations that you and I have been having and, uh, um, and, and, and the conversations that uh, we will continue to have. Um, but uh, obviously, um, before, I, before I say anything, I, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, everything that you said, uh, I, I, think, I think every word you said, in describing your testimony also sums up uh, my journey. So I came to Christ from a Hindu background. And uh, um, so before that, uh, I grew up in a very secular home. So going, walking into a church or a Catholic church, uh, um, so, you know, mass was not an issue for me. And my parents were very open-minded and very secular. And so growing up, we had the cross along with, with, with all the idol worship that we had at home uh, in, in, our, in our very devout Hindu home. We had the cross hanging in every room of the house. We had the Bible on our, uh, on our, on our shelf, on our, in our prayer closet. And I would hear my parents say the Lord's Prayer every day. Um, and um, uh, we even had the cross on, on, the, on, the, on our front door. So anyone who came and rang our doorbell saw the cross on our door, as well as the other uh, you know, Hindu symbols as well. And um, so, for, so obviously, my world had to really, God really had to turn my life and my, and my world upside down to bring me into the kingdom 
uh, 16 years ago. And so, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, uh, on the night that I decided to end my life was the night that I ended up uh, uh, taking some wrong turns um, and literally, literally, uh, you know, just, just stumbling into a church service, a Pentecostal church service. Um, and I and I left uh, that service saying, okay, God, I'm literally looking to the heavens and saying, okay, God, I'm going to postpone my plans to end my life tonight. Not because you've answered my questions, but because there are a whole lot of questions uh, that need answering, uh, especially after what I've seen at this church service uh, um, uh, tonight. And it was the power of God and display and, you know, signs and wonders and all of that. So I... I had seen Passion of Christ a few, the movie Passion of Christ a few months earlier. It was uh, the year 2004. And so um, the, the Jesus that I knew um, uh, was, was the Passion of Christ version. And so um, there was obviously a lot missing in the Passion of Christ. And obviously, since I had not read the Gospels and I had not read the Bible, um, uh, there was a lot I didn't know about the life of Christ. And so um, that started a journey and within three months of silently coming to that church without, it was a mega church, so no one had the time or, or no one had the, uh, um, uh, had, the had really the, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. No one had the time to really call or reach out or anything like that. So I just kept coming for three months, no calls, no SMSs, no follow-ups, no, no one reaching out to even ask me my name or anything like that. I was just a, uh, a, a guy lost in the crowd, and I, and I uh, just kept coming for three months. And at the end of three months, um, I just gave my life to the Lord and uh, entered entered uh, the waters of baptism and started serving from the word go. I remember walking up to uh, the, one of the senior pastors at the end of those three months before I got baptized. Say, and and I had the I didn't have much of an idea about church. Uh, the decorum or so, and you know, protocol and so on. So I just walked up to the pastor after a service and I, and I just said, I have a question for you, pastor. And he said, sure. And um, uh, I said, how can a guy like me from another faith come to your church service for three months and nobody talks to me and nobody asks my name? And uh, he turned around and he said, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, um, why don't you do something about it? And so, and so, I mean, hats off, hats off to the pastor, because um, essentially he rolled the red carpet for me and uh, said, you know, tag, you're it. And uh, though I was a new believer, just three months in the Lord from another faith, he, I, I was basically asked or tasked uh, and, and just given the responsibility of, uh, uh, you know, manag managing the newcomer's ministry for this megachurch. Yeah. And that started like, I mean, I, that would not happen in any church, <laughs> honestly, uh, today, right? Uh, they would want to see you uh, for a couple of years and then decide whether they want to entrust you with some kind of responsibility, mm -hmm. especially your responsibility of that, 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 that uh, weight and, and uh, size. Uh, but it was amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that journey. But as, as you said, you know, uh, when I look back, at my 16 years uh, as, as a believer, and I, I still feel like a kid, I still feel like I'm learning. I have uh, incredible uh, uh, testimonies, and uh, the church has been a channel of great joy, but the church has also been a, cha has also been a um, um, channel of grief and, and, and incredible pain. Uh, 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 nothing like what, what the world uh, 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 nothing like what I've experienced in the world. And so I'm not surprised that many people do fall away from church. And I remember when, when I was a new believer, I think in my first year itself, there was no honeymoon period, you know. Uh, I saw the best of church and the worst of church in my first year as a believer. Uh, and so I remember I came to the point in my first six months uh, of quitting and walking away, away from church. And the only thing that kept me was the grace of God. And only, the only thing that kept me was the voice of the Holy Spirit challenging me. And, I, and that's the first time I heard the voice of God that powerfully, where uh, in, in the still small voice telling me, um, if you leave, 
that's that's easy but it takes more more uh character to be to stay and be the change that you want to see mm -hmm. uh and um uh, will you be the change that you want to see and so uh and so that 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 i i felt that that was what the lord wanted me to do um you know stay and be the change that i want to wanted to see and um uh, and so I, I served in, in this mega church for 10 years. Uh, and so then again, uh, God, um, um, I love the interruptions of God and God just, uh, um, when, you, when you actually pray your kingdom come, your will be done, not my will, but yours be done and all of that. You never know how God is gonna answer that prayer. And so 2013, I love that you said six years ago, you, you mentioned that, you know, uh, the direction, uh, uh, your path, uh, you know, uh, changed six years ago. So it was the same for me. And 2013 was a turning point, but my wife and I, we had newly married. Uh, 2011, we were married. 2013, we were both without jobs uh, in, in a city where uh, you can't afford to stay long without jobs. And uh, we, were, we had just been married for a year and we spent the entire year, 2013, without jobs. And we spent most of that year apart from one another. And... Uh, it obviously strengthened our marriage, but we didn't realize at the time that God was doing something very special in us. So I spent six, uh, more than, around six to nine months of that year in Bangalore. And I'm not from Bangalore, I'm from Calcutta, but um, Manisha, my wife is from Bangalore and I ended up going to Bangalore. And that's where I went, uh, I ended up walking to the church where uh, she got saved. Uh, um, and, and that was where, that's how I heard Pastor Ashish Ashish Raichur for the first time. And I got a hold of his book, uh, which he was giving out. I mean, he, 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 he's incredible in terms of having his books available for free download on his website in multiple languages and also hard copies of his book that he would just give out for free uh, after every service. And I picked up this book, uh, two books. Um, the first book that I picked up was um, uh, Kingdom Builders. It was titled Kingdom Builders, and the red cover, the red side of the book, uh, the the, what, the words I read there blew me away. And, and the words that I read there was, uh, "God has not called you to build your church or your ministry. God has called you to build His kingdom." And uh, it went on to say a lot more. But that just the red cover of the book, what I read there, got me. And I obviously devoured the content of the book. I mean, you can imagine what the content of the book was like, if that's what the red cover says, right? And to see that coming from a pastor, to hear a pastor say that and write that book was just incredible for me. And um, uh, I got to meet other pastors in the city that I was incredibly, incredibly blessed by, uh, a church called Grace Chapel and another uh, pastor by the name of uh, uh, Michael Verghees and and I got to hear from him. I got to hear from him. And just casually, uh, he mentioned how Pastor Ashish, when um, Pastor Ashish anonymously or just, you know, just had a, uh, made a donation to his church or, or sent him a check uh, when he was just starting out. Um, and, uh, um, and when I heard that from Pastor Michael uh, about Pastor Ashish, I was like, Wow, you know, you don't hear testimonies like that where you're you're starting a church in the city and you're receiving a check from from other pastors in the city, uh, you know, just to bless you and mm -hmm. as a token of honor and a token of. So uh, I was like, wow! In my 16 years as a believer, coming from a Hindu background, I've seen more conflict and division. The whole Pepsi versus Coca-Cola spirit <laughs> in in between churches and in churches and between denominations and so for me hearing a testimony like that was like a breath of fresh air uh, and and uh, i just you know uh, i just continued learning and i continued uh, 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 just receiving so much wisdom and insight and inspiration not just from a message or a sermon but from the lifestyle and i could tell that uh, 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 it just encouraged me to, you know, uh, to know that wow, uh, there are people who are walking the talk. There are there are people who are uh, living this thing out, uh, uh, and that and that uh, uh, that that building church is different from building kingdom. And so, um, 
I, I know that there are different kinds of uh, um, leaders who will be listening into our conversation today. Um, um, there are lead, the fact is the fact is that there are leaders who are uh, consumed by fear and insecurity. Uh, there are leaders who are masking questionable motives, and that's in, that happens in every uh, sphere of life, in every every uh, be it in politics or in business or uh, you know in in every profession. There are there 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 are doctors uh, who are who are ethical, there are doctors who are unethical, and so on, lawyers and so on. And it, it's 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 no surprise that that happens in ministry as well. There are leaders who make questionable decisions, uh, masking questionable motives, sometimes saying all the right things, but the walk doesn't match the talk. And um, uh, sometimes uh, leaders who fall into the trap of, of uh, partnering with the spirit of fear and insecurity and self-preservation and all of that, and that hijacks their decision-making. Uh, but then there's this other group of sincere, well-meaning leaders. Uh, some some young, some not so young, who are asking themselves uh, the hard questions. Uh, like, like Francis Chan, uh, uh, who went through a journey where he was asking, self, asking himself the, some hard questions after the church that he started in his home became a mega church. And um, he was saying, wait, wait, why does my church not look like the book of Acts? And um, he, made the, he made the bold uh, decision of stepping down, stepping away from his mega church and launching a house church movement. Um, individuals like that, and, and, and Francis Chan obviously is a well-known name, but there are, I believe there are many other young people around the world, across continents, who are wrestling with, the, with, this, with this question, and especially in a, in, in a post-COVID world, um, uh, and something that you and I have, were speaking about yesterday was that it, what, what COVID-19 and the coronavirus aftermath and uh, the fallout from, from, uh, from the crisis, the economic fallout as well as the, the immediate impact on churches and gathering and so on. But what the, what the virus and what the, what the, uh, the, the fallout from the pandem pandemic has exposed is that there has been this unhealthy uh, over-reliance, unhealthy reliance on the building, unhealthy reliance on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on uh, the church building. And, and we, it's almost like the church is, the church uh, globally feels crippled, like, oh my goodness, how are we going to operate? How we're not going to be able to gather? How do we do? How, how do we do what we do? And people talk about the new normal when in fact, for the first a few centuries of church history, they didn't have buildings. You know, they, they just had, they went house to house. So while people are, are, are using the term new normal, well, it was normal for them in, in the first century and the second century to yeah, do church like that. And so I, I believe there are some sincere, well-meaning leaders who are asking, asking themselves the question, um, have we been doing things wrong? Um, uh, what does what seeking the kingdom first look like? How can I, how can I continue building um, in, in a way that reflects the king and the kingdom? How can I how can I uh, build in a way where um, uh, I'm I'm not um, I'm not idolizing the building, uh, but I'm I'm building the kingdom, and, um, and and I'm actually carrying and imparting a kingdom mindset. Um, I, I remember one your, in your sermon last year you used this amazing uh, you 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 mentioned you used this the statement that stuck with me. Uh, and, that's, and that line from your message uh, back in 2017 was, uh, there is something bigger than church, it's called kingdom. Uh, and I will not forget, Andy, uh, I remember in the mega church where I served, I heard many times the pastor in the main sermon, in the main message, say very, very passionately and very, very almost aggressively from the pulpit that uh, there are some so-called people who talk about Kingdom mindset, kingdom mindset. Um, the church and the kingdom are one and the same thing. Uh, uh, the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. There is no difference between the church and, king and the kingdom. But then I, then I hear, after that obviously I heard other min famous ministers from different apostolic leaders from different parts of the world 
who said the opposite, that the church and the kingdom are not one and the same thing. They are different. The church is just, an ex just one expression of the kingdom. Um, so yeah, I, I, just, your, just your thoughts on that. I know I've, I've shot too many questions at you, but uh, yeah, I, I just want, I want to hear you, man. On that. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to take pieces out of um, out of what you just said and and try to address uh, some of the more pertinent aspects of your concerns uh, that you just that you just communicated. Um, whether I put it in the same sequential order in which you presented it is another story. But I'm going to try to at least. Um, identify some very, very pertinent issues. Let me kind of uh, go back to when you said that the church in its original form was not concerned about buildings, was not too caught up with the institutionalized forms that we have grown so attached to today. And um, that's the truth because the first 300 years of the church saw an entity that was so dominant, so strong, so clear, so fixated on purpose, so Christ-centered, so unified in their objective, so completely clear in their mission and mandate. Nothing was blurring. Nothing was distorted. It was a church that was ferocious in every way. There was no barriers. There was no obstacles. Now, that was not a church that was completely um, void of uh, obstacles and void of resistance. The church in the early days, it was overrun with opposition, overrun with persecution. It was constantly under attack, whether it be from the political entities, whether it be from other savage, barbaric entities, the church was constantly under a severe dimension of persecution. But it was interesting that despite all of the external resistance to this movement that started by Jesus, and that's a very important term that we have to hold to because the church in the beginning was described as the way. So this was a movement. So despite all of the opposition to this ferocious juggernaut that we can call a movement, the church never slowed down, never stopped in its effort was never deterred in its objective. It was, never, it was never taken off course from its mandate, never drifted in any, any which way, despite the consistent barrage of external resistance to its efforts. You know when the church eventually slowed down? In 300 AD, and it is a Constantine. The moment institutionalized church became the norm, what external resistance failed to do man-seeking power and man-seeking clerical terms and man-seeking ecclesiastical office and man-hiding behind bishopric and titles, that slowed it down. In other words, the greatest resistance of the church and its efforts to enforce the purpose of God in the earth, it has never been external resistance. It has always been an internal corruption. Something within the system that causes the average believer to suddenly want to gravitate to titles and power and pyramidic forms, that is far more corrupting than external resistance from barbaric entities. Put it this way, the biggest, the biggest obstacle to the church is not an external devil, it is an internal ego. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle to the church arriving to its objective is not an external opposition, it's an internal motivation that is not consistent with the mandate allocated to God. So yes, the church in its original form um, was very clear. Buildings was not an issue. The moment ecclesiastical systems came into play in 300 AD, and there was this gravitation towards buildings and titles and, um, and, and, and um, offices, we began to drift away. And since then, we have not been able to capture the energy and the power that we had before 380. Now, that is what led to all kinds of reformation. We could talk about the Zwigli, we could talk about the Calvin, we could talk about the John Husses of this world, we could talk about Count Nikolai von Zinzendorf, we could talk about, about Luther, 
we could talk about all of these major reformers and each of those reformation initiatives was nothing more than the effort of the Lord to pull the church back into an orbit of authenticity, to pull the church back into an orbit of accuracy. Are we anywhere close to that intent? Maybe we are, not necessarily being represented in what I call the smoke screen that presents itself as church today. Most of what people define as church is born out of the models that are very apparent in front of us. But I want to assure you that, that, that most of what we think is church is a smoke screen. The truth is what lives behind what is currently apparent. There is an almost underground, like a city within a city, like a Zion deep inside of the immediate structures that is truly the, F, the essence of what the genuine ecclesia is supposed to be. It is almost like God saying to Elijah when Elijah said, I'm the only one left. In other words, Elijah in that regard almost represents the, the one that is most apparent. And God said, no, there are 7,000 others that you don't see, you don't know. They are not on your Christian televisions. They don't have the mega churches, but their hearts are pure, they are sincere. And so, yes, there is some effort of authenticity taking place and there are true models existing in the midst of all the, 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 the foolishness and the morass. There are true models, but they may not be the ones that you are seeing on Christian TV and the ones that are populating our magazines, etc. That's a different dynamic altogether. So that's the first point I want to identify. The other assurance I want to give to leaders is this. Despite the prevailing sense of insanity that you see being evidenced within the church in its current form, the purpose of God has not missed a single beat. It is still very much on course, very much on time. When Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, despite the, the, the pyramidic forms, despite the ecclesiastical forms, despite man's gravitation to titles and offices, etc., the purpose of God continues to move across the earth like a hot knife through butter. And so don't lose heart. Don't feel as though this thing is about to derail into, uh, into a failed dawn. This thing is moving dynamically to one powerful conclusion, which is a church victorious and all of the kingdoms of this world being assigned to the kingdom of his God and of his Christ. At the end of this whole process, God wins. And that's how this thing will go at the end of it all. To get back into some of the, 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 the critical questions that you've asked in terms of um, church and kingdom. Let me again pull this thing back into another realm. When Jesus said, I will build my church, a lot of what passes for church today is completely contrary to what Jesus said he wants to build. What we have today is a puerile, punitive, complete distortion of what God initially intended. Sorry to say that to some of you um, persons who are looking at this, but this could very well be a very disruptive conversation because a lot of what passes for church is what I describe as an anti-God model that is more Babylonian in its form and less kingdom in its operation. Church in its current form is a clear and present danger to anything that God wants to do on this planet because it is too religious. It is too concerned about non-essentials. It is too fixated on money. In most places, church is nothing more than an economic model. It is designed to sustain a few at the top and less concerned about the people that are being gathered and pointed to a place of, of power. During this current COVID-19, a lot of things were exposed. It is sad that in the middle of a global pandemic, some leaders are more concerned about their personal needs, about maintaining the building and making sure the rent is paid while people's lives are literally falling apart. Which and how many leaders were more concerned about those members that are left high and dry in the midst of a severe pandemic where families were lost, jobs were lost, economic fallout, etc. The church in its current form has to literally reinvent itself. We have to hit that restart button in order for us to really begin to effect and bring some level of kingdom influence upon the planet. Now listen to this. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. Not this current form. As a matter of fact, um, Jesus was not 
fixated on building a church as we know it. As a matter of fact, the word church and the concept of church as we know it did not come into our vocabulary until about 170 AD. It did not exist. When Jesus said, I will build my church, that word did not exist. The word that was used that is, is inside of our translation is a word that erupts out of the German language called Kirche, out of which you get the word circus or circle. What passes for church today in the etymology of the word, the original word for church is the very same word from which you get a circus or a circle. Put it another way, exactly what church is today is nothing more than a circus going around in a circle, going nowhere. When Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, that's an entirely different entity altogether. Church is not what he wanted. He wanted ecclesia. Even the original translators, they did us a disservice because they insisted, even the King James translators, they insisted that the word assembly should be removed and replaced with an, with an ecclesiastical model that we still use today called church. The word ecclesia is a different entity. Jesus did not say, I will build my church. He said, I'll build my ecclesia. And the word ecclesia is a serious serious entity. Back in the ancient times, when, when Rome will move into a barbaric entity, when, put it in other words, as though they are trying to evangelize a new environment, Rome would normally send um, about 300 of its best. That will be the best that Rome could possibly offer together with an individual who will act as a governor. So let's assume that um, uh, Location X is a barbaric entity. Rome moves into location X and they send an individual who will act as a governor. Together with that governor will be 300 of the best that Rome could possibly produce. Men and women, thinkers, philosophers, ideas, people who could produce ideas, who could contribute, to, who could contribute meaningfully to the formation of a society. Now, that one governor and the 300 of the best that Rome can produce it is what was traditionally known as an ecclesia. This was not some religious entity. This was not a bunch of people clapping hands and lifting their hands and going through a whole um, Christian gymnastic exercise. This was a ruthless nations transforming entity that was designed to bring a level of amelioration, a level of transformation, a level of, of impact and redemption upon any uncivilized society. And this is the question we have to ask. To what extent does the current kirke or circus or circle reflect the patterns that are deeply embedded in when Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. It is not a religious model that is concerned about punishing and that concerned about sending people to hell, concerned about cutting people off at the knees, neutralizing people's calling, reducing them to sitting in pews, locked inside of a church building and a church service for two or three hours. This was supposed to be the gathering. The word ecclesia was the gathering of the intelligentsia. And it will sometimes amount as much as 6,000 people. And they will gather together, sit, consider profound ideas, strategies that will be able to transform the immediate society. The ecclesia, back in its original form, would, would be actually the ones who would, who would justify and give reasons as to why the nation should go to war. They were like a senate, a present-day senate, this was not the model that we see in front of us today. And so when I say the church in its current form is a clear and present danger to anything that God wants to do, you would understand that the church is not consistent with the ecclesia that Jesus said he wants to build. That takes us into another very important angle. You look throughout the history of the church, and as I said earlier, every time God wants to bring the church right back into an orbit of authenticity, there is always something that we will associate as a move of God. You look through history, every move of God over the last couple hundreds of years started outside the church, not inside. 
You could look at the Martin Luther movement, which was a radical transformative reformation. That started by a man nailing 95 reasons why the church is wrong on a university wall. 200 years after, a guy called John and Char two men called John and Charles Wesley moved across England and Europe, bringing massive, massive change in what we know today as the holiness movement. Those men were kicked out of the church and they went on the streets. The movement of God in, in 1700 was not in the church. It was outside the church. In the 1900s, a man blind in one eye called William Seymour became the pioneer of the Pentecostal movement. That did not start in the church. He was a black man. He was basically kicked out of the church. That started on a veranda and the thing began to grow and they went to a barn. It was not in the structure, outside the structure. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, that again, he was kicked out of the structure and he started a movement in a cemetery. The Salvation Army movement started in a cemetery. We could go on and on in 1949 in Saskatchewan, Canada. We could go on and on. Here is the question. Here's the question. If every single one of these moves started outside the church, what killed it? We, we pulled it in the structure and we prayed it to death, we sang it to death, we worshiped it to death, or we preached it to death. Every move of God that God started in the earth started outside, we brought it in and we killed it. That begs a very important question. If all the moves of God started outside, then is it, is it something that God is trying to take us out of the structures but because we are so loyal to the structures, we took what God started outside, pulled it inside, and literally churched it to death. We, we buried it in religion, buried it with, with some kind of humanistic ideology. We buried it in titles and every other thing. And at the end, we were just happy with the emotional stirring that the move of God produced. Today, when you talk about a Pentecostal move, we are more caught up in the emotional stirring. You talk about a charismatic move, we are more caught up in nice songs and, and melodious worship, and we ignore the fundamental thing that God has always been after. He wants to bring this entity back into an orbit of authenticity and correctness so that he could get his purposes executed in the earth. Very, very important. Moves of God is not some little trophy that we have in a building that is designed to entertain us. What we call a revival in most circles today is a, is a Christian entertainment exercise. It tickles us and gets us all excited inside of a building. I believe one of the best things ever happened to the global church is what is happening right now. This current pandemic, I am really saddened by the lives that have been lost. I think as of now, it's up to over half a million. The countless millions of lives that have been affected by this issue, the fallout will be enormous, enormous. And so I want to put that caveat inside of there, that my heart goes out to the multitudinous individuals who are being affected by this situation. But in the midst of this carnage, God is literally dismantling this current distortion that is existent in the earth called the church in its current form. And he's beginning to point leaders to think outside of the box. For, for some nations, as much as four months, they could not go into their church building environment. They can't holler and scream and shout at their people unintelligently the way they've done it for years. Because listen, if you're speaking into a camera, you can't go through that religious exercise. I want to tell you today, uh -huh, that the Lord, uh -huh. you can't do that. You have to speak differently because this is no longer a bunch of people in front of you when you go through this gymnastics. So this season is really pointing people to think differently, act differently, reset this model, and let's put this entire ecclesia back on a path where God could really accelerate his intentions on a massive level. Now, those are some of the questions answered that you've, that you've asked, but we have to pull this thing right back and talk about the issue of the kingdom. Because um, I'll say this, that the kingdom and church, having said all that I've said before, the kingdom and church are two separate entities. They are not one and the same. Most people step into church and assume 
that they have touched the kingdom. The reality is that church ought to expose us to what true kingdom life is. But what we have in most circles, church introduces us to religious lifestyle. And it almost like fossilizes our spirit and fossilizes our brain. And we lose sight of the more profound reality called the kingdom. The kingdom in its most basic, most basic definition is that realm of God's uncontested rule uncontested rule. I describe the kingdom as the benevolent home of redeemed humanity. The benevolent home of a redeemed humanity. The kingdom is where God expresses his rule without any form of opposition. Now, in the context of my life, it is a matter of God having such uh, absolute control to steer to guide, to direct, and move my life without the resistance of my own flesh, without the resistance of my own thought, without the resistance of my own ego, without the resistance of my own carnal motivation. Within the context of your life, it's the same. In order for the kingdom to come, then your own carnality must go. Your own rulership of your life, your own handle of your life must go. Hence, the Bible says that if you are a son, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. A son of God is not just the fact, well, I am going to church. A son of God is one who surrenders control of his own life and allow the Spirit to guide and direct. We have to relinquish control in order for God to exercise true dominion in the affairs of our own lives. Now, the kingdom is a broad, a broad and dynamic space. Jesus did say that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the earth and then the end shall come. In most people's minds, we think that once we preach the gospel of salvation, then the end shall come. Those are two different messages altogether. He did not say the gospel of salvation. He said this gospel of the kingdom, the rule of God, the dominion of God, the, ex the exercise of God's ultimate rule. And that is not where God is trying to manipulate and, 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 and control in some um, inordinate manner the lives of men. It's a matter of man submitting themselves to the rule of God, allowing his dominion to express itself without any form of resistance and operation. Again, that is the succinct version. <laughs> that, that was that was that was powerful. That was that was heavy, uh, uh, power packed right there. Um, I, I, I'm I'm going to uh, yeah. You, you have said such such awesome stuff right there. I'm gonna I'm going to uh, share a couple of quotes, Andy. Uh, um, so it is just to complement what you've been sharing. Uh, so the quotes I'm gonna share. Uh, uh, are from uh, someone by the name of Graham Cook. Uh, and and I, I love the fact that uh, a lot that you, of what you have just shared right now, uh, you know, is, is very similar to what he's been saying. So uh, I'm just going to read a few quotes from him. He says, Every, everyone who is anybody knows that kingdom cannot come through church. Kingdom cannot come through church. Church has to come through kingdom. We are preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We are not anti-church. We are not anti or anti-church. In fact, we love the church, but we have to get things in the right order. It's the kingdom that is the overlying power over the enemy. And the church is an expression of that kingdom. The kingdom is about the church being involved in the world. Whatever God gives to us, we pass out to everyone that we meet so that no one, no one is safe from a blessing. We will find out the real from the false. We will find out who is committed to kingdom and who is just committed to their own empire. Every time you build church without a sense of the kingdom, without a sense of the kingdom attached to it, if you don't put kingdom first, you're building something just for yourself. The church is on a collision course with kingdom right now. The church is on a collision course with kingdom right now. And it is not about how can we fit the kingdom into what we are doing. Forget that. 
God is going to expand our understanding of the kingdom and then stretch everything that we do as a community so that we fit everything, so that we fit everything that heaven wants to do here on earth. Uh, I'm going to share another quote by uh, Professor Howard Snyder, uh, who uh, was a professor at uh, the Tyndale Seminary in, uh, in Toronto, uh, uh, Canada. And uh, he, is also, he was also the professor of history and theology of mission. And uh, he also pastored in Brazil and in uh, Chicago and Detroit. So he came up, he, he, I found this amazing quote of his that, man, I think you'll, you'll love this as well. Uh, it blew me away and I've not, not, not forgotten it. Um, he says, kingdom people seek first the kingdom of God and its justice. Church people often put church work above concerns of justice, mercy, and truth. Church people, church people think about how to get people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Kingdom people mm -hmm. think about how to get the church into the world. Church people, church people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom people, work to see the church change the world. Now, this is from a professor uh, of, of history mm. and theology of mission, uh, and who's, who's also pastored as well. So uh, pretty, pretty, pretty incredible, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty profound yes. quotes right there. So I, 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 yeah. I think that, that, that uh, dovetails with everything that you've, uh, you've, you've, you've shared right now. Um, I, if if I can ask now, uh, you've uh, the words that you've shared are shared are uh, are are deep, heavy, and profound. But but for someone who's uh, who's who's a uh, a pastor um, in 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 say somewhere in Asia or somewhere in the Middle East, um, how can how can they and if they've heard these quotes I've just shared and they've heard, and, and 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 if they've heard you right now. Uh, how, what, what can they practically do? Or what, what adjustments do they need to make? Uh, uh, or what, how can they check themselves to make sure that uh, they're not, not just building church, but they're building kingdom? Or what, what can they do to make sure that, uh, that they are preaching the gospel of the kingdom and not just the gospel of salvation? What does that sound like? Or what does that look like? Uh, and and how does how does that impact leadership, uh, especially uh, and decision making, in, in especially yeah. in these times? Now we can get all caught up with the, the the terminologies, and we can get all caught up with the with the theories and um, get lost in a world of um, of just throwing the word kingdom around. At the end of the day. It all, it all boils down to the extent to which we defer to God and his rule, the extent to which we allow that deference to affect all dimensions of our behavior, our motivations, our drives, and at the same time, the extent to which um, that deference affects the way in which we bring people into a state of life and empowerment. Simple. Now, we could get all, as they say in New Zealand, get our knickers in a twist and, and um, uh, get all lopsided with just kind of talking kingdom. Again, listen, the, the problem is I've been around um, moves of God over the years. And, and the sad thing is that we get caught up with the jargons and we sometimes miss the practice. So there was a time when the term reformation was a, a, a bad word. Everyone used it. Uh, it was like one of those catchphrases. It was being trended as, as it were. And people just assume that once you throw reformation as part of the lingua dialect, then you're a reformation man. And um, the danger that we're having today is that 
people are beginning to, to draw or gravitate towards the kingdom. And I want to be very, very careful in saying that the utilization of the term does not necessarily mean that you are adhering to its principles and its rules. So everyone is now touting kingdom. It's a kingdom this, a kingdom this, a kingdom that. But at the end of the day, the issue that God is concerned about is not the lingo, not the dialect, not the messaging, not the preaching, not the book writing. What he's after is a very simple triangle. The extent to which I defer to him and his rule the extent to which that rule superimposes itself upon my life and my behavior, and the extent to which my life that is being changed and transformed basically influence and empower humanity that's in front of me, whether it be the immediate members within my congregation or church, whether it be my community, whether it be my family, whether it be my friends, the extent to which the extrusion of a powerful existence move out of me and influence many others. Now, that in a nutshell is what life is all about. It is not a matter of hanging on to the jargon, not hanging on to the concept. It is not a matter of preaching and talking and saying and mentioning the word kingdom in order for it to be considered valid and authentic. Life exists within that dynamic triangle. Now, let's get back to some just pure practicals. You are a leader. You are trying to build an effective community wherever you might be. There are some critical issues you have to be concerned about. It's for some people, if you are so far left, you have to get right back to rewriting. You have to literally clean the slate and start over again. Others, are, it's as though you are moving in the right direction. You might be off a little bit. You know, it's like a guy who is... Um, who is into shooting and aiming and so for all his life, he does all what he's supposed to do. He applies himself, he practices, he understands how to deal with the wind, speed, etc. And so when he takes aim, he may not necessarily hit bullseye, but I promise you he won't miss the entire marker entirely. And there are some leaders who are like that. They are doing all the right things, but maybe not necessarily hitting bullseye. Just a little adjustment and that's some of them may need that, while others may just need to wipe the slate clean. But no matter where you are, whether you are, whether you are just missing the marks likely, or whether you are off by a million miles, the, the basic principle remains the same for no matter who you are. Number one, it's a matter of literally almost like submitting yourself to God in an overwhelming way to look at his principles and his rules with fresh eyes. Now, that's important. Because looking with fresh eyes means that you no longer look at the principles and allowing your look to be prejudiced by past understanding. Because if you go back and you examine the principles out of the paradigm of your past understanding, all you'll do is regurgitate and rebuild what you've always built before. Now, the fresh eye look, it sounds easier than, than how it really must be executed or implemented because it really takes a certain amount of um of death within yourself and takes a, a significant amount of of canceling out within your own heart for you to begin to look at truth from a different perspective that is why i have found that the majority of people who are beginning to really look at the word of god from a particular angle they are not looking at it from a, from an academic perspective it's as though their lives were thrown in a tailspin and from a position of total brokenness, they begin to look again. Because as long as you try to just make that shift from your comfortable space and you just kind of look at the word of God again, you begin, it, it still gets tainted. You know, as Jesus said, that you have to become a child. You have to literally die. Those are concepts that we can't deviate from, that the kingdom of God does not allow entry at the point of maturity. The kingdom does not allow entry at the point of life. You have to die. Brokenness is a critical issue. How do you do that? I don't know how you do that. You can't go and, and um, self-flagellate, but there, there must be a process that God must engineer within your own life that brings you to the end of yourself that you could no longer look at yourself with this great sense of admiration and approval but you begin to redesign and reconstruct your life from a position from i am a child i'm starting all over again i am going through a process of radical death those are very important starters 
Because if you don't stop there, friend, you will find yourself just still holding on to your title, still holding on to your terminology, still holding on to your big church mindset, still in pursuit of all of these wrong definition of success. Death is critical. What I have realized, and I've seen this over across the world over the last couple of years, the majority of people that I have seen who are deeply penitent, completely committed to truth, even to the point of their own pain and their own hurts, are those people that God literally sent through the rigor, sent them through the rigor. These are people whose hearts are so completely broken. It's as though they have literally, literally died from to their previous state of existence, no matter what it was, and they have emerged in a brand new place. That process is, 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 is like, listen, man, for me, I value that. The last six years of my life is the most treasured part of my whole existence. It's been the most painful, but the most purposeful. It's been the most brutal, but it has been absolutely the most blessed. Listen, that thing is critical. That process of death is important. It is the starting point of a brand new you. And from there, it comes down to this another pra other practicals in terms of new relationships. It comes down to forming new alliances. Don't reduce yourself to just submitting yourself to some other man in some network. That model is archaic, it is wrong. And so we have a whole bunch of apostolic networks emerging all over the earth, which is nothing more than a euphemism for another denomination, manipulative, imperialistic religious order. What we need in the earth today are just wonderful, excellent relationships, not a bunch of men basically sub sub submitting themselves to some kind of Stockholm syndrome masquerading as, 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 as loyalty. What we need are relationships. I need friends around me. I don't need a whole bunch of men above me. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks less about covering and more about foundations. We ignore foundations and run for covering because we don't have a set of comfort within ourselves and confidence within ourselves. What the average leader needs is genuine relationships who could nudge him forward, not necessarily throw him forward, to nudge him forward and go through the incremental process of change. And I, I, am, I am a strong believer in the incremental process because listen, we can try to um, have this overwhelming transformative process in our own lives and all we do is frustrate ourselves. There's a guy called Dave Brailsford who pioneered a very simple concept in in, in, and, and that simple concept allowed the UK cycling team to move from complete failures to absolute winners. And this guy basically says, you don't have to try to make these overwhelming changes incremental in small areas. 1% adjustments every single day could absolutely result in overwhelming transformation. To the average leader, it's not that you have to go and pray for five hours and pray for 40 days. It's five minutes or a very intense, God, I need your help. And from a point of sincerity, Make those incremental changes. Move that mountain one pebble at a time. Eat that elephant one spoonful at a time. Make that 1,000 mile journey one step at a time. And if you commit yourself to that simple, incremental, day-to-day -day transformative process, God will help you along the way. And sometimes, sometimes within that incremental adjustment, you have quantum moments where you leap forward in an astronomical way and you are the one at the end of the day look back and say, wow, I never knew this was possible. And so for the average leader, commit yourself to a process of brokenness. Throw off all of those titles, the reverend and the bishop and the apostle and all this kind of stuff. Get back to the most basic. Like John said on the Isle of Patmos, I, John, on the Isle of Patmos, I, John, your brother and companion the most expert apostolic figure on the planet in those days could address himself, not I, John, the one who laid his head against the breast of Jesus, the mighty apostle of love. No, I, John, your brother and companion. Bring yourself right back down to the most rudimentary level and be normal. Stop being this highfalutin, hard to reach, impossible, this, this guy way out there that nobody could touch. 
bring yourself down to the most basic. Be real, be normal, be practical. Reach out to genuine friends who could nudge you forward, encourage you, and bring you to a place of broader sight. And at the end of it all, just allow the grace of God to permeate your life and your heart and truly love people and try to represent the values in a way that is real, that is genuine, and that's authentic. This is not rocket science. Simple principles that I think works for me and I think could work for a lot, a lot of other people. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I thank thank you for that. Wow. Um, that that was so powerful and true and uh, uh, profound. I, I I if I can if I can uh, just add to what you're saying as well. I if I just look back at my 16 years, as much as I'm grateful to say a sermon I would have heard or um, or, or a message I would have heard or a Bible study that I would have attended or a prayer meeting that I would have been a part of, uh, the, most, the most, most powerful, um, uh, the most impactful times for me uh, have, been, have been conversations with friends. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, most, the most refining times, the most uh, renewing times for me have actually been conversations with friends in the car or over a meal. Uh, it's not really been in a conference setting necessarily, necessarily, or or in a in in it's in in a church building necessarily. It's been it's been in the context of of friendship and and friends with whom I can be brutally honest, uh, friends with whom I can be transparent, friends who I've known for sixteen years. Now let, let me let me jump in there, Tara. I yeah. think I think um, let me kind of make an interjection there. Um, that what you're saying is so incredibly important. Because um, one of the reasons why people are untrusting, they're not willing to trust a friend or, or submit or create an environment of transparency and openness with another friend is because, listen, um, um, people take your private information and sometimes use it against you. Mm -hmm. And we must come to the point where a personal conversation with you remains personal. Mm -hmm. that, that we, miss, we need to dispense of the gossip and the betrayal. What we have for friendship today is what I call chivalry with a knife held behind the back. Mm -hmm. We will put a hand out and greet you nicely, but we, 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 are, we are waiting almost to stab in the back. I have gotten to a point in my own life where I told people that, listen, most people, most of them, there's a few people I deeply trust and I could submit to in a heartbeat. But after a while, even within the corridors of Christianity, I tell people, listen, I treat most people like a snake handler. Mm -hmm. I watch them, I keep my eyes on them, I am very, very, very careful around them, and I always anticipate their strike. And unfortunately, those people have never betrayed me, or rather they never failed to act just consistent with their normal. Mm -hmm. And so it is important that in terms of building genuine friendship, that we need people that who can really guard, protect, we can trust, they can trust us, not individuals who, what I call fiendish friends, they mm -hmm. hang around you, but they will cut your throat in an instant. Mm -hmm. And we have too many of those. And the, the overpopulation of those fiendish friends is what causes people to live in isolation. They go through their pain, they go through their struggles, simply because they do not trust the average individual because humanity is still too prominent in the average man. Yeah, uh, so, so I think it's about, it's about rediscovering uh, uh, the, the simple old, old fashioned friendship. I was, telling, I, was telling a, a, I was telling some friends recently that something is wrong because it feels like when, when I was not saved, um, uh, we actually did friendship better. Uh, we actually mm -hmm. did friendship better in schools and in the colleges than we in our universities than we are doing right now. Um, um, when really uh, we should be uh, examples of what, uh, uh, and, and we should be experts really at demonstrating what um, healthy friendship and, and the old fashioned, simple old fashioned, old fashioned friendship should look like and looks like. And the world should envy other friendships that, they should envy our friendships and they should, 
You yeah. should look at our friendships and say that, oh man, I, I want that. I want what these guys have. Um, mm. uh, and I think what the trap, and I was, I, I was talking to a few friends and saying, just telling them that I think the trap that we have all fallen into, uh, uh, unknowingly perhaps, is that, is that we are probably caught up with this, um, um, or, or we have fallen into this whole cycle of, um, and as a global thing, and trying to impress people into the building, trying mm -hmm. to impress people mm -hmm. into the church, trying to impress people into the kingdom, instead of loving people into the into the kingdom, and and, and it's uh, it's it there's a dis distinct difference between trying to impress someone into the kingdom versus trying to versus versus uh, being intentional about loving people into the kingdom, uh, and so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I I hear you, and uh, and and uh, yeah. I, I mean, on on that same note, I mean, coming from a from a from a Hindu background, something which I felt very strongly was that uh, in the in in other faith communities, I come from a Hindu background, and obviously there are other faith communities. But there was there was more unity in those faith communities uh, <laughs> than there was in uh, you know in in. In, uh, that I saw between between churches, and and we have the message of love, we have the message of forgiveness that we blare. Um, uh, it's all over YouTube. The sermons are all there. Every church has its videos out there, and uh, uh, we are known for the message of of forgiveness, and we are known for uh, to, the message of the church is the message of the cross, the message of forgiveness, and people hear about that, and even people from other faiths know that that's the church's primary message. But when it comes to seeing that in practice, when it comes down to seeing that demonstrated, they don't see that demonstrated. And so mm -hmm. I lost count of the number of people who, uh, even in, at the mega church where I was at, I mean, on the weekly basis, monthly basis, announcements would be made about, oh, we've had 50 people get baptized today, 100 people get baptized this month or whatever. But I knew the backs, uh, on the other hand, I knew that, out of those 50 or 100, how many of them within the first year were going back to their, to their old faith, were backsliding, not for any other reason, but because they were seeing the double standard, they were seeing the hypocrisy, they were seeing the inconsistency, and they were seeing that the talk was awesome, there was charismatic talk, but the walk was not matching the talk. And so as new believers, they couldn't handle that. And so they, uh, they, 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 they came to a place, sadly, where, uh, you know, they bought into that whole thought process, uh, subscribed to that thought process that said, well, you know, if, if, this is, if this is what it is, then we are better off in our old, there was, there's more authenticity in our old belief mm -hmm. system and old faith than, yes. than what I'm seeing here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, I, 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 know, I know in your, in your message uh, back in 2017, you touched on a couple of things. You... You spoke about, uh, uh, you know, the the, the the churches acting like the synagogue operation, um, you know, run run by run by uh, that the, that the Pharisees were running. You see it throughout the Gospels and so on. And you you spoken about you spoke about the house of Saul and how there's this David versus Saul kind of uh, uh, um, uh, drama unfolding all over the world right now, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and. Uh, uh, you you spoke about Neot. You spoke about. I remember after our uh, after your message when when we met uh, for for a chat uh, the next day. You even casually uh, did bring up the point that uh, uh, that that even the twelve tribes of Israel, uh, um, you know, when they were united, uh, things went well. But when but when when uh, those twelve tribes were divided and when the tribes were fighting against each other, uh, it was a dark period for for the nation. Um, yeah. Are you okay to uh, if if you can share a bit about that? Yeah, um, we we can't mis miscount the value of um, of people coalescing and um, people joining themselves together and assembling themselves together and being dynamically united. You can't discount the value inside of that. I mean, the images, the images are far too many. I mean, the Bible talks about 
Behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the oil. Imagine um, these individual spices coming together to create uh, a dynamic, empowering component that not a single one of those spices could have produced. And, and um, the images, as I said, are just far too many. Um, the, the image of a body, the constant emphasis by Paul to use the body as a model for who we are, that the hand cannot say to the eye, I have no, no need of you. And um, those things ought to really drive us to live in a certain way. Isolation is, is demonic. Isolation betrays the very model you see in Genesis. Even God himself in the beginning, in giving expression to all things that we see in front of us, he did not act on his own. The word used in the beginning when it says God created is a plural word, Elohim. Let us make man and um, let them. In the beginning when God made man, he did not say let him or let her. Let them have dominion. And the image you understand there is that true dominion is not expressed out of an individual. It says in the Bible, we have the mind of Christ. There's no scripture that says I have the mind of Christ. When Jesus gave the, the pattern for effective praying and his disciples came and said, teach us how to pray. The very principle that's embedded in that prayer, our father, not my father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, give us this day. There's something about the our and the us that, is, that populates that prayer that tends to suggest that the moment you take the collaborative component out of true prayer and you lose yourself into this selfish individualistic disposition, you empty that entire prayer of its true power. So the images are many. And um, even with the tribes, as you mentioned at the beginning, that the moment all the tribes are joined together, I think in 2 Samuel chapter 5, when David is anointed, it says all the tribes were gathered together at Hebron to make David king. Every time the Bible speaks of all the tribes being gathered together, it, it, there's the constant image of things moving, things accelerating, new momentum forming. And if we could only get those images deeply embedded within the corridors of Christianity, deeply embedded within the precincts of the faith, we could be a lot more ruthless in a good way than we are currently. What passes for Christianity, you used the right word earlier because as you were speaking, I was searching for, for that word as you said it, is the issue of authenticity. And you said it rightly that, that I have more, before I got saved, the relationships that I had with my footballing friends or my basketballing friends were a lot more genuine, a lot more real because it was not expressed through the prism of religion and inauthentic faith and self-righteousness and hypocrisy. And I think religion is doing us a disservice. Even Jesus said that the children of this world are wiser than the children of men. And my little two cents addition is because the children of this world, they, they, they don't have the hurdle of religion to jump over. But religion has done us a disservice because what passes for relationship within a church building, the little handshake and the little hugging of a neck, it is driven by, self, by such self-righteous disposition and me versus them, us versus them kind of attitude that it empties the expression of all of its meaning. But if you could only dispense of these hang-ups, as I was saying to a group yesterday, you know, there's this scripture that says that about the tribe of Issachar. Just last night I had a meeting with a group and the tribe of Issachar is mentioned in this regard. It says that they knew how to decode the times. But they, the, their ability to decode the time was not for selfish reasons. It says the tribe of Issachar knew how to decode the time so that they can, so that Israel will know what to do. The principle is this, that Issachar's ability was not for personal gain, but for corporate advancement. What happens in most circles is that whatever I have as a value to me, I use it for personal advancement against the 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 weakness of others and sometimes what we call strength 
is only a demonstration of other people's weakness and our inability to contribute to the weak having strength. Issachar, their disposition is, I have sight and knowledge of the times for what Israel need to do, not for what I need to do. And so for, for this faith to move forward with a greater degree of, 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 of correctness, we really need to get out of the little barriers and the little, um, little walls that we've built. And the pattern we see in the book of Zechariah is quite simple. Jerusalem will be built as cities without walls. We have to get to that reality. As long as this is my church and this is my network and this is my organization versus your organization, we still have too many walls. And it's not a matter of building porous walls. It's a matter of having no walls at all. We need to build entities where my people can freely interface with your people and my resources can freely interface with your resources without having to go through the little barrier of my religion and your religion and my ideas versus your ideas. And as long as we continue to build faith the way it is currently being constructed, we continue to be injurious to the bigger purpose that God is seeking to advance. There are too many models in the word of God that speaks to us about unity. Even God himself says these words, the sovereign Lord will do nothing without at least revealing it to his servants, the prophets. God himself submits himself to a collaborative agenda. Why is it we can't? And it's interesting how that word is communicated in Amos. The sovereign Lord, it does not say Elohim. It does not say, well, El Shaddai. But this is the sovereign Lord. This is the God who can do whatever he likes because he is sovereign. But a sovereign God chooses to enter into partnership and collaboration with man to advance his cause. Why is it we are constantly seeking to build an us versus them entity to show that we are strong and they are weak, that we are powerful and they are nothing. And if at all, we try to get to the weak, we don't try to empower the weak in most organizations. We try to literally suck the weak into our orbit so that the weak then populate then populate our little world. And it's not a matter of empowering them where they are. People are still building these, these, these um, religious oligarchies. We are trying to create new imperialistic systems and pyramidic models. The time it is far, way, literally too spent for us to be concerned about selfish agendas and personal empires and building empires of self and creating little entities that we can celebrate our sense of, wow, we are all this and then some. The, the times are way too spent. We really need to get to the point where people have to dispense of their little egos and dispense of their concept of a call. A lot of people who speak about a call of God, God has not called them. God has not spoken to them. They are just driven by a selfish agenda and an egotistic mandate seeking to make themselves a lot more than what God has ordained that they be. And as long as we live in that particular matrix, we continue to be injurious to the purpose of God. I need to be as practical, as normal, as down to earth, as real as possible, and as authentic as possible, so I could embrace a Tara, whether you are in Dubai or on the other side of the world, I must be able to embrace my brothers, my family, my friends across the earth, without all of the religious hangups that, that would seek to suggest, well, I am reverend, bishop, whatever, this or that, and just be real and practical, man. That's where we have to get this face to. Real, practical, authentic, genuine, at the heart, hardcore, people who genuinely love each, love each other. Not the, not the Chateau General model. When I say Chateau Generals, during the Second World War, these Chateau Generals would live in their little palatial environment and send instructions down to the guys at the battlefront. And the instructions that they were giving to the guys on the battlefront, it was so impractical, so unnecessary, and, and they themselves, these Chateau Generals were ill-prepared to do it themselves. And so we speak about love, but it's a chateau general concept that we are not prepared to do it. We are far more comfortable preaching it. And that, that really 
is, um, is my take on where this thing has to go. We really need to become more real and more authentic to make this thing meaningful and real. Yeah, so I, I yeah. thank you, thank you so much for that. I, 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 I remember reading uh, this book again that uh, Pastor Ashish had released where he compiled uh, the history, the details of every single revival and, and the move of God that hit the planet from the book of Acts to date. And um, uh, he, he, it was amazing to see this common thread through all those revivals. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, uh, the, the disturbing and, and also the, 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 the touching, touching thing to, to note uh, from that book was that nearly every single move of God, nearly every single revival came to a grinding halt because of division. Uh, because mm -hmm. because of um, and these were incredible moves of God revivals where you know in entire cities entire nations uh, you know were uh, it, it experienced the power of God not just for a day or a week but for years and so um, I, I'm I'm just wondering now obviously in this I was telling some friends this the other day that in the current uh, uh, climate. In the current uh, situation that the world find the church globally finds itself in, uh, it, I, I I was telling a friend the other day that at the end of the day, if 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 uh, the church doesn't have an answer, and if all the church has, if all a leader has is a message of, uh, is, is just a sermon, and not really any practical help and practical support then when the good times, when the crisis passes over and the good times come, um, those individuals will turn around and, and question those leaders and say that, mm. you know, um, uh, thanks for the sermon, but I didn't need mm. a sermon. Where were you when I really needed help and I needed practical support? Yeah. Where were you when I really needed uh, help? Now, now you're talking to me, now you're reaching out to me, but where, where were you when I really needed you, when I really needed uh, help and I really need that support and a sermon isn't going to do the sermon alone is not going to do the trick all right yeah. and so um, I'm wondering I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking to myself apart from radical uh, collaboration uh, which can only really happen when when your ego flies out of the window and, and there's there's a death you spoke about um, uh, apart from the radical uh, collaboration uh, um, and to be to be to be frank, you're seeing that in the marketplace in the business world as well, right? In tough times, yeah. companies merge. Companies, you know, uh, right. um, have to collaborate to in order to survive, right? Banks and so on have to merge. And so I'm 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 asking the question: um, uh, Do you think, apart from collaboration, do you think that every leader needs to develop and needs to formulate a seven mountain strategy? To engage the next generation, to 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 bring like-minded people to the table, um, and and to and to uh, uh, help those who are believers but unchurched believers uh, come back and uh, and, and just uh, just form uh, these collaborative friendships with the goal of impacting these seven mountains. Do you think, do you think if, if every church and every leader had a clear seven mountain strategy, do you think that would help find a uh, common ground? That would, that would help, uh, uh, help uh, rediscover uh, areas of collaboration? Do you think, and do you think that could also help reach unchurched people and enlist unchurched people? I, I am convinced it will. I mean, um, let's go right back to the to the to the fundamental principle that Jesus said. He said, "By this, men shall know that you are my disciples." Mm -hmm. And that this was not a message. It is not um, the size of your congregation. It is not um, the title that you possess. By this, men shall know. So there is, in fact, uh, an evangelistic component, if you will, a redemptive impacting component, if you will, just by the, the, the authenticity and the genuineness with which we genuinely relate and love each other. But I need, to, I need to throw a little caveat inside of there again, because I think the moment you talk about collaboration and unity and, and uh, people living together and loving each other, we, we, we get this distorted image of I holding your hands and singing Kumbaya and, and thinking, well, that's what unity is all about. 
um, the model you see in the Book of Acts is what we call the one purse economy. We have to get back to those principles, one purse economy, that unity and my loving you is more than just, well, we share in the same space, I hold your hand and we say we committed to the purpose of God. But listen, my commitment to you must go way beyond my holding your hands and talking about the things of God. I mean, in a real hardcore sense, we have to get down to express the practicals. I mean, if Tara is in a state of need, one purse economy, my purse is your purse. What I have is yours. And I don't think that, we, that, 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 that the faith has gotten around to those concepts. In the book of Acts, they had one purse. Jesus and his entire disciples had one purse. They all lived out of one purse that it was a matter of all of us pooling our resources that each of us can draw out of it. And we need to get to those real practicals because unity in this regard is more than just a matter of, as I said, I hold your hands and we sing kumbaya. This thing has to get down to real practicals because when Jesus said, by this men shall know that you are my disciples, the world is not looking on at me hugging your neck, you know. They, they have to see something more than that. The world has yeah. to see more than me shaking your hand. We have to literally, as you said earlier, if all we do as Christians is criticize the world and criticize the systems of the world and the patterns of the world without creating a genuine alternative, we are nothing more than critics that we cannot point at the flawed, failed models, criticize and condemn them without creating genuine alternatives. And we have the capacity to do it across the earth, that there are sufficient relationships existing across the world for us to genuinely create models and patterns and systems that the world could genuinely look at and be impacted by the fact that these people are real. And I think if you have to look at one word, if you have to identify one word that has caused the enormous fallout, the enormous exodus taking place across the earth. Recently, I was looking at CNN and looking at one of these major leaders from the, 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 the Baptist religion talking about some of the fallout. It was a sad indictment upon the entire um, Southern Baptist religion. I don't want to call the name. But the guy was saying, since 2016, there has been in excess of over 40% or more people, particularly young people, leaving the church in droves. And he put his finger on the real issue because across the world, people are leaving. And what is causing the fall of one word, one word, the lack of authenticity. Mm -hmm. People are seeing a religious movement that lacks authenticity. We are self-righteous, but inauthentic. We are religious and inauthentic. We talk about love and unity, but we are inauthentic. And that's the number one reason that is contributing to the exodus across the world. People have no problems with our messaging. They have a lot of problems with our messaging. How do we live this thing? How do we apply it? How do we walk in this thing? And the issue of inauthenticity is creating enormous problems in every single model all across the earth. At the end of the day, I totally agree with you in terms of the seven mountain principle. I've heard it. I understand it. I relate to it. We must get down to genuinely contributing to the welfare of others, whether those others be the next generation women, strugglers, stragglers, wherever they might be, we need to take this faith and practicalize it. What we have done, we've created really good theoretical concepts and we are masters of the academic model. But for some odd reason, we have to get back to a position that Seth Joshua held in the days of the Welsh revival at a time when the movement across Europe had collapsed into academia where everyone is more concerned about crossing their T's and dotting their I's and sounding very profound and articulate, this simple guy looked on at the trends of Christianity across Europe, and he prayed that God would raise up an unintelligent miner, someone working in the minefield, to blow the minds of the whole church structure, and God did. 
that we have to get past all of this academia and the strong emphasis on articulation and get to the point of pragmatic practicalizing of the principles. As I said earlier, nothing is wrong with our message. A lot is wrong with our messaging. <laughs> but we have to practicalize this issue and make this thing real. Until we do that, we will continue to see the fallout, we'll continue to hemorrhage, we'll continue to see the exodus because all humanity is asking for is not profundity, what they're asking for is authenticity. Wow, 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 uh, wow. I, 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 I know we need to have, uh, I, I, I could talk to you for hours and hours and not get tired, but, but I, I, I think I've, I've, uh, I've stretched you too much today and I feel terrible about it. Uh, but but I know, I know, I know people are going to, going to really, uh, I'm, I really believe with all my heart that there are, there are friends and there are guys from different parts of the world. I'm going to share this with everybody I know. Uh, I'm so happy this is being recorded and I think I'm looking forward to our next conversation because I think everything we've spoken about and, and, and we have shared and discussed today, I think this, this, uh, this would be, uh, a great intro for uh, for the next conversation on kingdom economics, which is quite frankly a yeah. foreign concept uh, for for a lot of people. Uh, uh, and so, um, yeah, I would love to love to uh, have your thoughts on that another time. Certainly. But uh, Certainly. I just I just want to say thank you with all my heart. Uh, thank you for for pouring out your heart. Thank you for uh, you have the gift of of saying things. Uh, um, you know, with, with such uh, profound wisdom, uh, I would probably take hours to say what you say in one sentence. So, so I, I just want to say thank you for uh, your voice is so, so precious. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've been personally blessed. Uh, I've learned, okay. I've learned personally, uh, just just over, um, over the last last hour, uh, I've, I've just gained so much insight. And uh, uh, there, there are things I knew, but it, they're just being reinforced by everything that, that you, you have shared. And so I know there, um, uh, everything that you have said and shared, um, I just know it's going to resonate with a, a lot of, lot of uh, guys who are asking, who are sincere and uh, wrestling with the questions, asking themselves the tough questions, uh, especially in this season where the building is empty. And uh, uh, you know, everyone's asking questions about how do we do discipleship? You know, what what does discipleship look like now? Uh, what what does what does you know uh, uh, go into the world look like now? <laughs> you know, and and so um, I I believe all those who are sincere. Um, I love I love that Jesus said that those in the side of truth will listen to me. Yes. So yes. I, I I really believe that those who are on the side of truth will. We'll hear his voice and we'll. Uh... I, I I I like that, Tara. I like I like um I like how you how you describe it. I like how you how you teed up this conversation. I think this conversation is nicely teed up, and there's a lot more that we can have out of this. I mean, at the moment, um, I have not been enjoying the best of health, and um, despite all of that, there are times we do as much as eight or nine Zoom meetings a day from across the world. Um, some of them have audiences in the hundreds and others have a nice combination. And I think it is a conversation we started talking about to pull together some other guys that have a similar conversation. But uh, um, something that you said, I think is critical, the whole issue of asking the hard questions. And I think leaders, wherever you are, listening to this conversation, it's a moment for us to ask the hard questions. You know, um, at the turn of the 1400s, there was a guy called Voltaire. And um, Voltaire is one of the, uh, strong contributors to the Renaissance. And um, one of the things that happened to Voltaire is because is, is, um, he began to buck the system, began to ask the real questions. And the way I put it in my own words, he began to doubt the default. Things that have been handed down to him that he just took up as real, never questioned, he began to question it. Um, he was such an offense to the system that the system basically sent him to exile in England. Little did the system know that while exiled in England, all of what Voltaire started to think, consider, 
it grew, ballooned, enlarged, and expanded inside of him so that when he came back to France, he hit the system at full frontal and literally contributed to the whole Renaissance era. And I think every religion needs a Voltaire at this moment. Yeah. Those who will begin to doubt the default, the yeah. things that has been that the things that have just been thrown at us, and we never stopped and really considered the genuine truth behind it. That yeah. we just accepted church as it is. We just assumed that church is coming together, clapping our hands, going through the gymnastics, and a guy preaches a sermon at us, take our money, and we go back home for the rest of the week, and we are wonderful. We have to doubt the default, that I am living in that particular zone. That if you don't start to ask the hard questions, I read a book recently by, um, by, uh, by Ian Hersey Ali, and in this yeah. book she talks about, it's called Heris, Heretic, interesting book. And in this book she talks about how she accepted her religion. I won't call that religion what it was. She accepted that religion as gospel. She went through all through life, go through, went through all the torment, all the punishment, all the pain of that religion because she considered that to be the norm until one day she found herself in what her religion described as a heretical environment. And she saw life in a different way. She ripped her passport, she threw that passport away and suddenly began to go through a reformation in her mind. And I think a lot of Christian leaders, a lot of apostles and prophets and teachers around the world need to have a moment like that because we automatically assume that Christianity is the model that we have always practiced. Never once did we look at the system, ask the hard question, doubt the default, and have a reformation in the mind. Rip up our passport as Ian Hersey Ali did and begin to think because what we always accepted as gospel and as church and as Christianity may not necessarily be all that Jesus really is seeking to build in the earth today. So I just want to kind of stick that pin right there, man. The need for us to ask the hard questions because that's what we did today and that's what we will continue to do. Beautiful. It's been a joy doing this with you, Tara. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so uh, we're going to end it right here. And uh, I just want to say thank you again for your time. And um, yeah, I wish you a speedy, speedy recovery. Uh, the Lord who started a good work in you will complete it. Uh, and, and so uh, just, just grace and strength, um, strength in every bone, strength in every muscle, strength and healing uh, from head to toe. Amen. Uh, just thank wish you, you the very best, Andy. I love you. you. I love your heart. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Lovely. Thank you, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Bless you.